Let me uh, read this, just, uh, this verse, and then I'll kind of review from last week. Won't be long. Just want to share a couple of things as it relates to finishing strong. I want to encourage you, if you missed last week's message, please make sure you get a copy of the podcast. Um, you can go to rcfnetwork.com and click on the podcast link and download that so you can be caught up. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter or the author and finisher of our faith. The next phrase says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me jump into verse 3. Verse 3 says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, verse 4 says, you have not resisted to the point of shedding, shedding your blood. And 5a, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as a son, and let me add, and daughter of God. As we go into the word, point to yourself and say, self, I am a son and da or daughter of God. One more time, say self. I am a son or daughter of God. Uh, God. Now, if you're a male, say I'm a son. If you're a female, say I'm a daughter. Say self. I am a. Yeah, of who? Of who? Amen. Good. Let me just review, review briefly from last week, and then I'm going to talk through what I want to talk about. So if we can throw the first um, thing that we shared with you last week on the screen, I want to move through there that God would just move and have his way. Now here's a uh, couple of things that I shared with you last week as we review just this, and then I'm going to move through. Here's what we talked about. To finish strong, uh, we must get to the place where we understand our encouragement, or more importantly, who is encouraging us. That's a very, very important statement. What we saw last Sunday, and we saw the same thing on Wednesday night, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Here's what I said to you last week. The people that are going through or that our predecessors that are there to encourage us, we cannot fool ourselves into saying, well, they're not going through what I'm going through. Come on, say amen. amen. They're there to encourage us because they have set the place, they've been there, there so you must understand who our encouragement is. Number two, to finish strong, the second thing that we need to do is eliminate or remove all distractions. Now, I need you to repeat after me. Say, I must remove all distractions. That's very, 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 very important because um, if you're in a race, we cannot allow distractions to slow us down. The verse says that we must lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely to us. And I'll hit that in a little bit as you move on into the message. But distractions will slow us down in life as it relates to us doing what God would have us to do. So if you have a, let me use a King James term, a besetting sin or something that has, is serving as a hindrance or an opposition to us doing what God would have us to do, I want to challenge you this morning to get rid of it. Are you with me? Turn your neighbor real quick, turn your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, get rid of the besetting sin. <laughs> yeah, here's the third thing real quick. To finish strong, to finish strong, um, you must, or we must, let me put myself in it, we must persevere to the end, okay? Here's what I said to you, Scripture says, the race is never to the swift, nor to the strong, but to the one that endures to the end, okay? Here's what came up Wednesday night as we were talking about this. This Christian journey, this race, wherever you find yourself in life, whatever it is you may be going through, you must understand that you can't start and then stop, and in the stopping, fool yourselves into thinking you're still in the race. I want you all to hear me say that, okay, because I'm going to hit something on the end of the verse. Because here, here's the thing. If, if, if I'm running and, and I stop and I took a break, don't fool myself into thinking I'm running. Everybody is going by me. Are you with me? And then, and then, and, but let me just go here. The reason, the reason a lot of us probably have not finished that undergraduate degree is because we stopped and took a break. I know I got at least two witnesses out there. 
Yeah, and, and here's what you're saying. I should have never stopped. And, and when you're ready to get back in the grave, you 75. And you, <laughs> and, and you feel as if, come on, let's be honest with ourselves this morning, right? So endurance, persevere to the end, persevere to the end. You cannot stop, you cannot quit, you cannot give up along the way. You must keep running, okay? Now let me put a parenthetic um, in the middle of this. If we can go to the next slide. I need to stick this parenthetic here to kind of encourage us um, before I move on with the rest of the message. The quick question is, for me, and it is for you, why do I need to finish strong? Why do I need to endure? Why do I need to persevere? Why do I need to keep going? Why do I need to keep pressing on? And let me just add to the phrase, why do I need to be all that God would have me to be? Now, I've got three things that I want to say about this real quick, then we're going to continue on. Number one, the dominant reason that you and I need to continue on and to persevere is that we must realize, first of all, that we were saved to realize our preordained destiny in Christ. Okay? And I'm going to explain what that means because I, I, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of us don't know why we were saved, and, and, and as a result is we sit on our blessed assurances, waiting, I said assurance, amen, <laughs> waiting for the plane trip to heaven. And I want to admonish you that there's divine intention attached to your liberation. Now, let me, let me say it differently. Now, listen at this. When God sent Moses in Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, to go to Pharaoh to say to Pharaoh, let my people go, he did not say, let them go so they can have good church. He didn't say let them go so they can party for the rest of their life. He didn't even go as far as to say let them go so they can just celebrate freedom. Here's what he said, and I wish we had time to go there, but we don't. Exodus chapter 8 verse 1 says it this way. Go to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go, and then he has this phrase, that they may serve me. Let me go to the end, then I'm going to back up. By virtue of the fact that I've given my life to Christ as personal Lord and Savior, I am saved to serve. Are you with me? I think you're going to lock into where I'm going with this finish strong. Matter of fact, jump over to, go over to Ephesians chapter 2. I need to read this. I need all y'all to see this real quick, and then we're going to come back to this text. Ephesians chapter 2, and then look with me at verse 8. I just want to read this one, and then we're going to talk through it that God may be glorified. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And I want you all to see this and see what it says so we can get to, to where God would have us to go. If you're in Ephesians 2 and 8, say amen. Here's what verse 8 says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, or not of yourselves, okay? It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man can boast. Let me explain that before I moved on. Here's what you need to know as we talked about the fact that it is by grace we have been saved through faith. It's a gift, not work, so no man can boast. Hear, hear me say this. I played no role in Jesus going to Calvary other than the fact that I messed up. Well, let me just get black and white. Other than the fact that I sinned. I played no role in the finished work of Christ on Calvary, he did that. And here's what he said once he was, um, died, was buried, and rose from the grave. I paid the price for your sin. All you need to do is accept me, and now you're saved. Okay? So here's what that means. I can't brag about how holy I am and credit it to my righteousness. I can't brag about how much I do and credit it to my righteousness. Come on, am I only, only somebody in here? I can't brag about how much time I spend in prayer and credit it to my righteousness. That had nothing to do with my salvation. My salvation was a free gift from God that he bestowed upon me. Are you hearing me? Now, let me, let me get ahead of myself. So here's what happens when I accept Christ into my life as personal Lord and Savior. He accepts me into his family, and I now become a son or a daughter of God. Golly, I wish I had somebody in here. 
I am a joint heir with Christ. I'm going to hit that in a little while, okay? So now look at the next phrase. Look at the next phrase. Look at verse 10. Now notice what it says. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, what's the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For good works which God prepared when? Beforehand or in advance. And some of your translations said that we should do it. Or some of your translations said so we can walk in it. Let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what that means. Before the beginning began, before the foundations of the world, God had a plan in place. And God decided what he was going to do. God decided what he wanted done. And God decided how he wanted it done. And God, God was in control. So here's what God said. I need me, a Robert Matthews, to do this. This is before time even began. I need me, a Derek Washington, to do this. I need me, a Jomo Thomas, to do this. I need me, a Katana Gilbert to do this. Come on. And he, he picked your name and he said, I need you to do this. I need you to do Y'all not hearing me this morning. And he called each and every one of our name before the world began saying, here's what I want you to do. And then latched unto this, then he backed up and he said, let there be and there was. <laughs> and his infinity, infinite wisdom, his supremacy in his greatness, he spoke and things came into being. He breathed and the world came into existence. He stomped his feet and mountains were formed. Y'all not hearing me. He clapped his hands and the earth came into existence. And he stooped down from the dust of the ground and he created man. And he breathed into his nostril and said man became a living soul. But watch this. Man started to do his own thing. And the beauty of the graciousness of God is he let man do his own thing. But in his time, I want you all to hear this. He went to Calvary to forgive us for sins we would commit now, tomorrow, and in the future. And when he got ready, he said, okay, it's time. Hear me carefully. I did not create you for your own devices. I created you for a specific purpose, for a specific reason to do a specific thing. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he created when? In advance so we can walk in it for us to do it. So hear me say this, by virtue of the fact that you and I are now saved, we should be in lying, line doing what God created us to do. So lock in to finish strong. Since God created you to do it, you better stop giving up along the way. Amen. Whatever it may be, and I'm going to explain that in a little while, all right? Uh, so here's the thing. Lock in to be. Our destiny now, since God created us for this preordained destiny, it's not restricted to the inside perimeters of the church. Oh, I'm not going to make it through this message. Your, your destiny is not create restricted to the inside perimeters of the church. The problem with church folk is we get saved and we fool ourselves into thinking that our salvation should be used only on the inside of the church. And I said it that way intentionally. Are you with me? And, and, and so here's what we do. We come to church and we said, I'm saved, but ain't nothing for me to do because I'm not an usher. I'm not a worship team member. I'm not a, uh, you're not hearing me. I'm not a preacher. I'm not this. I'm not whatever. And here's the mistake we make. Now that we're saved, we draw a line between the church and the world. And so when we come to church, we act churchly. And when we go to the world, we act, wor y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. And we act as if it's a distinction because we think the, the, the only way God could use us is in the church. Hear me say this this morning. John 3.16 says that God so loved what? Yeah, y'all know, y'all know it. Matthew 28, I think it's the verse 18, 19 says, Go ye therefore where? Into what? All, yeah, yeah, come on, I want y'all to hear me say this. So when we come here, we come here to get fueled up so we can go in the world. So the beauty of what I want you to hear me say is that the race is not only supposed to be ran in the church, it's also supposed to be ran in the world. So when I leave here, there ought be no difference between how I act in church and how I act. Yay! 
Oh, oh. Y'all, don't, don't, don't throw me in hell yet, right? But, but if I'm in the clubs, I shouldn't act like club folk. Oh, y'all don't got, oh, he's blasphemous now. If, 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 if I'm a fu- at a funeral, I shouldn't act like unsafe people. The fact that I'm saved, it doesn't matter where I am in the world. And let me even attach this to this to do. Or what I do in the world, I, am still, should, I should still be doing what God created me to do. So wherever I find myself in the gym, on the basketball court, uh, on the dance floor, at a wedding party, it doesn't matter where I find myself. People should look at me and say, there goes the child of God. Salvation is not something I take off and run in church. I mean, put on and run in church and take off when I leave church. The race is a continual progress or process that I run and I never quit running. So let me say it this way. Whatever your gift is, let me say it differently. Whatever your profession is, whatever your line of business is, whatever it is, wherever we find ourselves before the foundation of the world, God planned for you to be doing that so he can get glory through it. (laughs) Man, we miss that. Because here's what somebody say, ain't nothing spiritual at my job. (laughs) You're there. (laughs) You're there. You are placed in a dark place to bring, yeah, y'all get that, yeah. To illumine the dark place. So here's what he says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And here's what we think. The light should only shine in church. That's why we got to put on shades in here because it's too bright. (laughs) Whole lot of lights. Are you with me? Come on. But, But imagine if I take this little light of mine and go into a dark place and let it shine. And I run. But here's what we do. We stop running when we leave here and we go into the world and we feel it's rest time. Let me give you some examples and I'm going to move on. I'm spending too much time there. If you notice Jesus in his ministry, when he was in church, he finished strong. Luke chapter 4, I mean, when he came, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Around verse 16, he had anointed me to preach. You see him doing ministry in church. Y'all hear me? You see him coming to church and the man with the withered hand was there. And he heals him. He does ministry in church. But lock into this. Then he leaves the church. He goes out into the community. And in the community, he doesn't turn his light off. Come on. He still lets his light shine. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He encounters the cypher Phoenician woman. He meets the demon-possessed man. He meets the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all not here. And me, he fed the 5,000. He did all of this out in the world. And then when he went to the party and the music stopped and they ran out of wine, he still he still ministered, be it at church, be it in the world, or be it socially. For him, this race, this persevering with endurance is not an on and an off thing. It doesn't matter where we are. We keep pressing on. That's why we need to finish strong. Are you hearing me? Turn to him and say, neighbor, finish strong. Come on, go to the next slide. I want y'all to see this next one. Then I'm going to press on. I need y'all to hear this because we miss this too much, okay? So here's the thing. What is my motivation? What is my motivation for finishing strong? I dealt with this one last week. Focus on the prize. Come on, say focus on the prize. prize. Go Go back to Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews chapter Chapter 12. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm just going to say a brief thing about this because I'm, I want to I wanna spend a couple of minutes on what I want to share to you that's different this morning. Hebrews chapter 12 and jump down to verse 2. Look at verse 2. Okay. Look to verse 2. You guys are there? So you run this race and verse 2 says, looking to Jesus... The founder 
I'm in the ESV, and the what? Perfecter of our faith. You guys are there? Now look at the next phrase. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated where? At the right hand of the what? I'm going to say this and then I'm going to give you an illustration and then I'm going to move on because we dealt with this last week and we dealt with this Wednesday. Resting or stopping the race does not guarantee you a prize. Got to make it to the end. Now, here's what I said Sunday. If you're running the race and you look so much at me that I distract you from continuing in the race, you're looking at the wrong thing. Here's how we flesh this out even further Wednesday night. If anybody in front of you stops you from running the race, can we be honest here? We're looking at the wrong thing. Are you hearing me? Okay. Because here's what we do. We, we, don't, we don't like what we see in front of us and we drop out and we stop and then fool ourselves into thinking, I'm looking to Jesus. If I'm looking to Jesus and my focus and my sight is on Jesus, everything else, listen to what I'm going to say, is nothing but a distraction. And if I'm so locked into Christ, you can't distract me, baby. Because you're, you don't have a reward to give me. You don't have a heaven or hell to put me in. Are you hearing me? I'm trying to encourage us to finish on, to finish strong. It's the same thing in life. Let me give you a couple of applications. It's the same thing in your business ventures. And the same thing in your, with your goals in life. Wherever you find yourself, don't allow circumstances to become a distraction from you making it to the end. Are you guys all right with me? Okay, enough of that. Let's press on. So now notice this. Jesus then became the ultimate example of persevering or persisting through opposition. Now let me go here and then I want to show you a couple of things. Notice what it says now. Look at um, verse 3. Consider him who endured, and this phrase, this noun, from sinners. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Now, consider him, let, let me just take a moment here, who endured from sinners, from, come on, say from sinners. That, 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 that phrase from sinners tells us who it was that tried to distract Jesus. And then listen to what the text says. Such hostility against himself. And then focus on that, and that ought to be the motivation for you to finish strong. Here is the Son of God being persecuted, being talked about, being scandalized, being pierced in his side. Y'all not hearing me. Being judgment hall to judgment hall. Being accused of a whole lot of stuff he didn't do. Yet and still, none of that prevented him from making it to that cross. And the author now is trying to get us to, to, to lock into this. That if you're thinking on quitting, take a moment to think about how Christ persevered and let that motivate you. In other words, don't let anything block you from Realizing the, the God's preordained purposes from you for you, it doesn't matter what the thing is, because you and I did not go through what Jesus went through on that cross of Calvary. I'm talking about beat beyond recognition, where you couldn't even recognize his face. But here we are in church. Don't let nobody talk about me. I'm done, church folk. Even in our families, let a family member lie on you. Heck, let your husband not bring the groceries home. 
And what do we want to do? We quit in the race. We don't persevere. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Go to the next slide so we can make it to the end. Repeat out of me. Say, don't give up. Don't give up. Once again, say, don't give up. So number one, the reason you don't give up is because you look at Christ. The second thing, I want us to realize that you and I are sons and daughters of God. Lord have mercy, that's a shout right there. Amen. Oh, God, come on, come on. Now, now look at, look at, look, where's that? Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Have you forgotten, church, believers at Hebrews, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you? As sons. I'm going to let that resonate for a while. This is almost like, like, like the author of Hebrews is saying to people, do you know who you are? It's almost as if he's saying, Levon, do you know whose you are? If Jesus was a son and he could do that, you as a son or daughter should do no less. Oh, I wish I had somebody. Because, because, and, and, then, and then in other passages he talks about greater is he that is where? Than he that is where? In the world. So, so if we know whose we are and who we are, nothing ought to distract us from persevering to the end. Because we're sons, we're sons, we're sons. Come on, we're sons and daughters. We belong to God. Now, I don't have time to go to Romans chapter 8, verse 14, but we're going to read this. We're going to read this when we get to Wednesday night. It's going to come Wednesday night. Here's the thing you need to know about being a sons of God. Son, being a son or a daughter of God is, all, is not all Cadillac and roses. Because here's what we do, not that I'm a save, not that I'm saved. I'm a head and not the tail. I'm above and not beyond. I'm the lender but not the borrower. Borrower, And none of us want to say I'm being persecuted right now. Or it's tough right now. Or it's difficult right now. Sonship does not exclude us from the persecutions or the distractions of the world. But sonship ought to be more than enough to motivate us to persevere and to press through when it gets rough. Are you hearing me? Sonship is enough to press us to go on to make it all the way to the end. So I want you all to hear me say this. It doesn't matter what your goal, what your drive, what your thing is. By virtue of the fact that who you are, let me tell you why sonship is so important. Is remember with me, God created you before the foundations of the world. He had a plan for you before the foundations of the world. He had a ministry for you before the foundations of the world. So when he adopts you into son, he, in sonship, he now empowers us. Man, you got to hear me say this. Powerful presence of God. Paul says it this way in Philippians, I can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. Are you hearing me? We get distracted too easy. We get frustrated too easy. We get discouraged too easy. And we stop too easy. Sonship ought to enable us to press on. And be who all God would have. have you. Say, I am a son or daughter of God. Now, one last thing and then I'm going to stop. Sonship is not always fun. I have three children. My oldest accused me of being a child abuser. I mean, he got like some whooping. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Living right, though. <laughs> my youngest, yeah, my youngest made a video of how bad he got whooped. I better not say that too loud. I might be a social or human service worker in here. And next thing I know, somebody knocking on my door, locking me up. But the point I want to make is this, and I'm almost done. Because they were my children, to make sure they do what I thought best for them, I disciplined them. 
I know this is tough. This is tough. And the discipline was not for my benefit. It was for their. So, so, I'm not bragging. I'm not bragging. I'm saying this as humbly as I can. I thank the Lord that we have three children that are walking with the Lord. Amen. Are you with me? I thank God for that. Um, but I grew up in a home where I didn't tolerate foolishness, and I've got three grandchildren. And boy, when grandpa and grandma walk in the room. <laughs> no, 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 I'm saying that. They, they, they hug up on us. That was a joke. That was a joke. But the point is this. As a parent, I discipline my children so they can be all who God would have them to be. Now, I need to say that to say this. We're sons of God, sons and daughters. God, as a heavenly parent, is no different. He will discipline. He will discipline. I'm just going to read this text. I need to say all that, then I'm going to read this. God will discipline. Now, this, this is going to put your life in perspective. Because I'm going to be crazy enough to say, could it be that some of the storms we go through in life is the hand of God on our behind? Why? Because we're hard-headed, we're knuckle-headed, and we want to do what we want to do versus being finished and strong and enduring to the end. And so every now and then, God will reach down, I told you not to do that. What's wrong with you? Why you think you're going to do your own thing? And then we so crazy, come to church, y'all pray for me, the devil's on my back. <laughs> no, God's got that behind. That's what it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and the only reason I'm saying that is because you are a son or daughter. Now, if you're not a son or daughter, don't put it on God because he ain't going to touch you because you ain't his. I, I need to say all this before I read the text. Are you with me? And then I'm going to say one thing in the middle, then we're going to pause. So let's read, let's read, let's read. Look at, look at, look at verse 5. And it says here, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. Now look at this. Next phrase. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved. That means when you get a butt whipping. For the Lord, verse 6 says, disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens every son who he receives. Look at verse 7. It is for you that you have to endure. It is for discipline that you have to endure. You kind of get what I'm saying? I really like that text because what it's saying, he whoops us so we can persevere. He whoops us to get us back in the race. He whoops us so we don't give up so we can finish strong. Watch this. God is treating you as a son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Check verse 8. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated... I like the King James here. It says, then you're bastard and not son. So check this out. I, 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 I'm not going to make it. If you could sin without conviction, go check the name of the parents on your birth certificate. If you can drop out the race... Make me check who your parents are on your birth certificate. Don't fool yourself to say, I belong to God because God said if you belong to him, he'll whoop that behind to get you back in the race. Amen. I need to say one more thing. I know I'm out of time. I know I'm out of time. Watch this here. Verse, besides this, we have earthly fathers who discipline us and we respected them. Come on, worship team. Shall we not much more be subject, and watch this phrase, my translation said to the father of what? Spirits and live. Here's what that means. In you and in me, when we came to Christ, God deposited his Holy Spirit. And here's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. To correct, to reprove, and to instruct. So I'm at this place. I'm at this place now in my walk with God. If I think about sinning, I get a butt whipping. Some of y'all are there too. Come on, y'all. 
I mean, it's kind of like me walking into the bakery at King Supers, right? <laughs> I'm going down the aisle, and, and, and the Spirit of the Lord is already talking to me. Finish strong, man. Don't do it. Finish strong. Don't do it. If I'm a bastard or an illegitimate child, there is nothing to convict me. Now, don't nobody get mad with me. That's why some of us could continue in the sin that we find ourselves in because there's nothing in you to convict you. Check name of the parents on the birth certificate. I want y'all to hear me say this, and I'm done. Come on, y'all, come on. Come on, worship team, y'all, come on out, come on out. Verse 10, for they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been, and that word said, trained by it. The reason I don't do some of the things I used to do anymore is because I've been retrained. And I am continually being retrained. Are you with me? It's, it's like every time I mess up and every time I sin and I drop out the race and I stop finishing strong, God, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And he rewards my faithfulness. He don't only beat, but he rewards my faithfulness. And over time, I learn, you know what? You shouldn't do that. Because God doesn't like that. It does not produce a fruit of righteousness. So I now have renewed my mind. And my challenge for all of us this morning, if life frustrates you and causes you to drop out of the race and causes you to quit and causes you not to finish strong, I want to remind you this morning that Calvary was for you and Calvary was for me. He thought I was worth saving, so he sacrificed his life. He thought I was worth keeping, so he cleaned me up inside. He thought I was to die for, so he sacrificed his life so I could be free. And do you think for one moment I'm going to allow you to distract me from the race? I'm going to allow any enemy, any, no, I'm going to finish strong because of who God is for me. So stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet. I just want us to sing this for a few moments so we can hear from God and then allow God to be God in our midst. And if God is speaking to you this morning, come on, Pastor Kate. I want to encourage you just to get to the place where we can be all who God would have us to be.